We're going to have our Bible reading now. Uh, if you do need a Bible, Jodie's up the back. Just put your hand up and she'll bring you a Bible. This one down the front. Uh, our Bible reading tonight, uh, we're finishing off in 1 Peter 5, uh, going from pretty much the whole chapter, so from 1 to 14. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favour to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. And so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Please keep uh, 1 Peter 5 open in front of you. And please join with me as we pray. Father God, we thank you for this special divine moment. As we hear you speak in the power of your spirit. And so we ask now that you would give each of us open hearts and minds, that we would be ready and willing to receive your word to us tonight and so that we would grow more and more into the joy and assurance and peace that comes only from Jesus. We pray in his mighty name. Amen. Well, we are finishing out our series in 1 Peter, a series that we've called Exile. And that's been a theme that's kind of really been dominant throughout the book. We saw it uh, the first week of the series, that uh, we are God's elect exiles. Now, there's a, there's a glorious kind of tension there, isn't there? To be chosen and yet on the outside, to be special and yet excluded. And yet if we are honest, we find that glorious tension hard to live with. I don't know if you remember the first uh, week that we uh, we started the series, I shared the story of a pastor who'd burnt out in ministry. And one of the things he said that had really helped him recover was being really honest about his struggles. And he wrote this, If we share only strengths, that can lead to competitiveness and resentment. But if we share weakness, it can really build community. That's a brilliant insight. Uh, and then you remember that first week I asked you if you'd be so brave to put up your hand if in the last five years you'd had a season in life where you were really struggling where you didn't know how you were going to go on, where you didn't know how you'd cope. And across all our services, at least half the room put up their hands, including Chapelaine. Wow. In the last five years, more than half of us have had a season where it wasn't just that we were struggling a little bit or we were finding life a bit tough, but we didn't know how we were going to go on. We didn't know how we would cope. It was amazing. It was a moment of wonderful honesty and transparency. But it was just a moment. Because what we normally do on a Sunday is the thing called the car park miracle. Have you heard of this? You may have experienced this miracle. This is how it works. It doesn't matter how awful your week's been. 
or how hard you're finding it to be a Christian in your workplace or amongst your friends or on campus in school. It doesn't matter if you've had a massive Barney in your family on the way here or just before you left. Something happens. You get in the driveway and you park the car and you walk up the footpath and a miracle happens. It's all fine. And you see people and they say, how are you going? Great. How's your week been? Amazing. No problems here. It's a miracle. Why do we do that? Because most of us are struggling in different ways at different times. And yet on the Sunday, we feel this need to fake it, to pretend. I think part of the reason is that our culture has fooled us. We're given this false expectation that the normal experience of human life should be permanent happiness. You're free to live how you like. Be all that you can be. Be the best you and be happy. And yet when reality breaks in, when our experience isn't like that, we think, oh, everyone else is doing really great. Everyone else has got their life together. Not me. Must be something wrong with me. Maybe I've failed. And so we choose the car park miracle. And that's just so exhausting, isn't it? Like if your life's not going well and you're really struggling to come and put on a brave face and pretend and fake and smile and say, my week's been amazing, that's really tiring. One of the beautiful things about 1 Peter is that God sets us free from that exhausting game because he's wonderfully honest with us. He says, life is this glorious tension. We saw the first week, chapter 1, verse 6, you will suffer grief in various kinds of trials and then glory comes. Chapter 5, verse 9, that we just read before, you're not alone. Christians all over the world are experiencing suffering and struggle. And then chapter 5, verse 10, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. It's so helpful because do you see where that little while of suffering ends? When we get to the eternal glory that God has called us to. And so the little while of suffering could be as short as 80 or 90 years. It could be as brief as your lifetime. Compared to eternal glory, it is a little while. This is the wonderful honesty that God gives us. In a broken, fallen world, suffering is the norm, not the exception. And if you're so young or so kind of sheltered that you've never experienced any, it is coming. It is coming. And if you suffer, when you suffer, the reality God gives us, the honesty God gives us to say that it's not something wrong with you that you're suffering. It's not that you did something bad and now God is punishing you. It's not that you failed in life. It's just that you're going through this thing called life for a little while and then eternal glory. But it's still hard to live in that glorious tension, isn't it? And so 1 Peter 5 helps us in a bunch of ways. Uh, We see that we need to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. It's so clear in the second half of verse 5. Just look there with me. All of you. So who's that talking to? Just call it out when you see it. It's not a trick question. All of us. Yes, I told you it wasn't a trick question. So if you're sitting there thinking, I wonder if this applies to me. Yes, yes, it does. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but shows favour to the humble. It's so clear, isn't it? You don't want to be proud. If you're proud, God will oppose you. God will frustrate you. God will stand in your way. Why is that? Why does God oppose the proud? Because we refuse to let him be God. We refuse to acknowledge that we're just creatures in his world under his mighty hand. And that is hard for us because our culture has drip fed us. The air that we breathe is that I am my own and I belong to myself. And so I'm free to do what I like, live how I want, shape my story in the way that I want. That's a lot of pressure though, isn't it? Like think about it. If, if, if I really am my own and I really do just belong to myself, then it's all on me. It's all up to me. I am alone. And that's a lot of pressure a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. And the other thing is that it robs us of one of the sweetest joys in life. Look at verse 6. 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. See, pride robs us of that. Pride robs us of the experience of God lifting us up in his time, of him caring for us. But humility comes open-handed and says, I, I can't do this. I, I, I can't manage. I can't cope, Lord. I need your help. I need your grace. I need your strength. And I think for those of you who are teenagers or have just finished school and you're learning to make your way in the world of work and relationships, it's, it's hard. And I wonder whether it's actually harder than it's ever been because there are so many voices at you these days feeding in ideas. They're competing, they're contradictory, they're confusing. And so humility for you is to say, Lord, I don't know how to do this thing called life. I don't know how to make the right choices. I need your grace. I need your help. I need your wisdom. There's this lovely story about a guy called Philip Melanchthon who was a friend of the reformer Martin Luther. Now, Melanchthon was a bit of a, uh, a, a worry because he had a bit of a pride problem. He tried to control his world and the things around. He wouldn't let go of stuff. And so that would make him very anxious and stressed. And when he kind of got worked up at times, Martin Luther would come to him as a gentle friend and put a hand on his shoulder and say to him, let Philip cease to rule the world. It's like verse 6, isn't it? Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Let Philip cease to rule the world. So many of our stresses and worries and anxieties and pressures in life come because we won't be humble. We try to control our lives, run it our way, pretend that we're kind of like God, and then we stress out because we can't do it because we're not God. And so we need to say, let James cease to rule the world. So I want you to bring to mind now the area of your life where you struggle to let go, to let God be God. Maybe it's your career, your study, your hopes for the future, relationships, family life. Bring that to mind now and then speak into it those words with your own name. Let Cease to rule the world. That's how we live this glorious tension called life. We humble ourselves under God's mighty hand that he lifts us up in due time. And then we learn to serve like Jesus. Look at how Peter urges the leaders in the churches that he's writing to. Verse 1, To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock. Just pause there. That's so important for us in our culture. We are not individual Christians doing our own thing. It's not my faith and my Bible. It's us. We are God's flock. We are a church. We are a community under God's word. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. What do you notice there? Anything about being tall, dark and handsome? Anything about being a cultural influencer with a massive Twitter following? Anything about being the biggest personality in the room? It's all about heart, motivation, how you lead. Because however you lead, whether it's being a pastor or on parish council or you lead music or you lead a team or you're a youth leader or a kids leader or a community group leader, however you lead, people can get into leading in the wrong way. They can take on leadership because, well, everyone else was kind of doing it and I felt I should. Or because they felt the pressure and they didn't know how to say no. And so then that what can happen is you think about leading as, well, I didn't really want to do it and it's taking my time, so what do I get out of it? And so the flock, those you lead, become pawns in the game of how do I get something out of leadership? And Peter says, no, be willing and serve and be an example. Where did Peter learn this? Because you read the Gospels, he's pretty arrogant. Where did he learn this? From Jesus. 
See, look at verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Peter says, I was there. I saw him. We saw it in the Lord's Supper before, didn't we? Jesus said, I'm among you as one who serves and I've come not to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. And Peter says, I was there. I saw him. I saw Jesus, the Messiah, heal the sick. It's amazing. I saw him cast out demons with a word and humble, arrogant religious leaders. And I saw him calm a storm with a couple of words. I saw him walk on water. I saw him raise the dead. I saw all that power and majesty. And I saw him serve again and again and again to death on a cross. Friends, be like Jesus. Serve with all humility. And then there's a word in verse 5. In the same way, those who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. So those of you who are teenagers, young adults, it'd be easy for me to beat you up with this verse and say, well, submit to your elders because the Bible says it. But I want to appeal to you. You have so much to offer. And you don't know, but the pastoral staff here at Norwest talk so often about how excited we are for what God could do with your lives, how you could serve, how you could be an encouragement how it could be a blessing. But it's going to take humility. Now, no one thinks that they're arrogant. Like if I was to say to any of you, do you think you've got nothing to learn? I'd say, well, no, of course not. But there is a way of doing church and DC and community group that's humble or arrogant. Humble is your Bible open, learning and listening. Arrogant is talking to those around you and not listening distracting those around you, not listening to your leaders. Humble is how can I serve? How can I build others up? I remember about 10 years ago here at Chapel Lane, there was a young man amongst us uh, who was a nice guy, but a bit of a clown. And then one time he went, uh, I think God had done a work in him. He went and found, he asked around, he went and found the wisest, godliest man he could at Chapel Lane. And he said, will you read the Bible with me and disciple me? That takes humility. And there is so much godly life wisdom in this room. If you look around, you've got the Rajaratnams, the Huffs, the Mallisons. You could go on and on and on. The Murrays. Why not invite them to your DC or to your young adult community group and hear their story and ask them how they have walked with Jesus for 20, 30, 40 years? That's, hum- that's humility. You'll learn to serve like Jesus. Well, finally, we thrive under God's care. Look at verse 7. It's an amazing verse. Don't miss this. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You could just sit with that for hours, couldn't you? Especially that second half, because he cares for you. Just look at me, Chapel Lane. God cares for you. Do you know that? God cares for you. The God of the universe created everything. You read Isaiah 40, as we touched on before, and he is so majestic that the nations are like a drop in a bucket for him. They're like grains of sand through his fingers. And he cares for you. He cares for you. As I meditated and thought about that during the week, I remembered that moment in John chapter 11 where Jesus turns up at the funeral of his dear friend Lazarus. And Jesus knows he's about to raise him from the dead, and yet he weeps when he turns up. Isn't that odd? Like he knows he's going to raise him from the dead. Literally in a few minutes' time, he's going to be talking to Lazarus again. So why does he cry? If Lazarus had Lazarus' sisters had known that Jesus was about to raise him from the dead, they wouldn't be weeping. They'd be full of excitement and anticipation. They'd be planning the party. So why does Jesus weep? Why doesn't he just walk past all their crying and their mourning and grieving with a big smile on his face? In a moment, you're going to see. Why does he weep? Because he cares for us. He opens his heart to our pain. He enters into our grief because he cares for us. 
So Chapel Lane, cast all your anxieties upon God because He cares for you. Now, we need to be clear here that the Bible is not talking here about clinically diagnosed anxiety. It's not saying throw away your medication, you don't need a psychologist, just pray your way to good mental health. No. Verse 7 is talking about the fears and the stresses and the pressures and anxieties of life. And God says, cast all that on me because I care for you. It's that humility we talked about before when you come and you say, Lord, I, I can't do this. I can't carry this. I need your help. I need your grace. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. I think this is a link between verse 7 and verse 8. If in our Bibles, they've made it a new paragraph, like it's a separate idea, but it all flows. We were talking about it at staff conference uh, during the week. Jody pointed out that we should look at the difference between God and the devil here. And I know that shouldn't be a surprise that there's a difference between the God and the devil. They are, they are different, if you're unclear about that, different teams. But you look at it and it's so helpful here in 1 Peter 5. God lifts us up with his mighty hand and he cares for us. The devil is like a lion. He prowls looking to devour. And one of the ways the devil attacks us is to take our anxieties, our stresses and our fears and he says, ah, oh, don't bother about casting that on God. You, you can handle it. Yeah, and you don't need to go crying to God like some whimpering child. You can be strong and take control of your life. And if that doesn't work, well, you can self-medicate with alcohol or porn or binge shopping or a relationship or you can get on and watch endless hours of Netflix to escape. And don't, don't bother with the prayer because that doesn't work, does it? And don't go to that church because their lives are all perfect and they don't get you. He doesn't care for you. He wants to devour you. So cast all your cares upon God because he cares for you. As I continue to reflect on that during the week, my mind went to that conversation Jesus has with a Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. As you read that chapter, it's pretty clear she's got a lot of issues in her life. Five husbands, and she's living with a sixth man who's not her husband. She's been scorned by her community. That's why she's going to the well in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day when you don't go, because she's been shamed and excluded. The other women will not meet with her. She's confused, ashamed, defensive. But as the conversation goes on, Jesus brings his powerful grace to bear upon her, and she discovers that she is accepted by the Messiah, and she becomes evangelist for Jesus. Remember, she goes into her local town to, to share about Jesus. Now, do you remember what she says, what her first evangelistic talk is, her first gospel track. Exactly. Now that's odd, isn't it? Why, why would you want that to be known? <laughs> like if we're at the harbour chatting later and someone comes up to you and says, I know your heart. I know everything you've ever done. And I'm going to tell everyone. What are you feeling at that point? Maybe terror would be something close to it, right? You're leaving pretty quickly. There's no car park miracle there. <laughs> For someone to have that kind of insight into your life is normally terrifying, isn't it? To really know what goes on in here, in here. But when that insight, that revelation comes from the Jesus who cares for you, who knows all your guilt and shame and loves you the same, it sets you free. It liberates you. It transforms you like the Samaritan woman. So Chapel Lane, cast all your fears, your anxieties, your stresses upon God because he cares for you. So perhaps you're here tonight and you're finding it really difficult to be a Christian in your workplace, in your networks, on school and campus, and you feel really alone in that. Cast all that upon God because he cares for you. Perhaps there's stresses and anxieties weighing you down, suffocating you, choking you. Cast all that upon God because he cares for you. Perhaps there's a secret guilt and shame that no one knows about in your life. Something you've done, something you've thought about that no one knows. And yet because it's there, you have no rest, no peace in life. Cast it all upon God because he cares for you. 
Don't believe the lie that you need to carry that alone. Cast it all upon God because he cares for you. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we, we know that everything you say to us in your word is for our joy and benefit and everything is helpful. And there are moments, there are times when a particular verse, a particular passage speaks so powerfully into our hearts. And we thank you that, for that tonight, that you have called us to humility, to enjoy your, your goodness and your care. And you have taken us to a place of realising and seeing that you care for us, care for us more than we could ever have dreamt or imagined. And so I want to ask for each person here today, whatever stress, anxiety, pressure, struggle that they're experiencing in this broken, fallen world, that you would enable each of us to cast and throw that upon you, give that over to you, because we know that you care for us. And as we do that, please bring to mind memories and images and stories and words of Jesus who walked this earth with such compassion and love for us who are like sheep without a shepherd. And he brought us into a flock and he is our shepherd. And so we ask that we would throw all our cares upon him because he cares for us. We pray this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.